Now, returning to the topic of uh, how economists model production, one of the most important questions we face is why are they so blind to the role of energy in production? And this is because of what are called production functions dominate how economists try to build numerical models of the economy. The neoclassicals use the Cobb Douglas production function. They also use another one, uh, or they, they talk about another one called the uh, continental assisty of substitution. Uh, most of the time, though, they'll default to using Cobb Douglas. And that shows output as a function of technology times labour and capital. And there's no role for energy in those three, unless you subsume energy and technology and they haven't consciously done that. Post Keynesians use what's called the Leontiev production function after Vasily Leontiev. And it's fundamentally an empirical relationship between the amount of capital as measured, the amount of output as measured. In most countries, the ratio of capital to labor tends to be between two and four, normally about three. And that ratio is called the capital output ratio. And neither, even the post Keynesians don't have an explicit role for energy. So when you see economists thinking about things that involve energy, they don't think about energy's role at all. So here's Nordhaus back in 1991 saying that for the bulk of the economy, it's difficult to find major direct impacts uh, of climate change over the next 50 to 75 years. Well, bollocks to all that. This is where my little insight from 2017 or thereabouts is crucial. Labour without energy is a corpse. Capital without energy is a sculpture. Nothing can be produced without energy. And therefore, because we are so dependent upon fossil fuel sourced energy, and that is causing global warming, that'll compromise all of GDP, including those sectors that Nordhaus couldn't uh, work out in any way in which they might be affected by climate change. So that's why this topic is so crucial and so fundamental at the moment. Now, uh, amusingly enough, normally what I've got to do when I, I find a piece of neoclassical nonsense I have to make a hypothetical example to show what they would, would think in this particular situation. So I'm very pleased when the neoclassical comes along and does exactly what I say they would do, and I can then quote them rather than having to make an argument about what they would do if. So Backman and a few other co-authors wrote a paper in the Vox magazine saying, what if Germany is cut off from Russian energy? And said that contrary to fears expressed in the public, substitution, Notice there is a substitute for energy. Substitute and reallocation would keep the likely economic costs below 3% of GDP and fear mongering about catastrophic consequences of an energy embargo does not hold up to academic standards. Well, the problem is the neoclassical neo academic standards. So we have to dive beneath and see how he reached his reasoning. And his argument was that if you use a strict Cobb Douglas production function, then you get something of the order of a, of a 0.3 to 0.4% fall in GDP for a 10% fall in energy. And if you use a CES function with uh, uh, low levels, high levels as, well, actually low levels of substitution, you can get a 1.5% fall, but that's about it. So the change in energy is six times as big as the resulting change in GDP, maybe even 30 times as big. Now the post Keynesian model says, 10% fall in energy, 10% fall in GDP. And Buckman put this graph together to contrast the different theories, which is very useful for my purposes. So that is the neoclassical minimum, a 10% fall in energy going from 100% uh, here to 90% there, causes a 0.4% fall in GDP. That's the stock standard Cobb-Douglas production function. CES with low substitutability, gives you a maximum level of damage of about 1.5% fall in GDP for a 10% fall in energy. Whereas the, the Leontiev model, one for one proportionality between energy and GDP, and that gives you a 10% fall. And why the huge difference? Well, it's because the neoclassicals treat energy as the third factor of production. So they start from seeing output as a function of technology A, labor L, capital K, and then when they consider energy, they just tack it on as another factor of production. Uh, now, when you do that, of course, it has to have its own exponent, uh, as, as the other functions do, and the exponents still have to sum to one. So they use a value for the exponent for energy, which is based on its share of GDP, which is about three or four percent. So this is from a paper from um, 
uh, Engstrom and Garsden in 2016. That's their production function. And they gave the exponent of energy a value of 0 0.03. Bachman and Co, you took energy as, as E and then everything else as X and gave the alpha of the value of uh, 0 0.04. Now, post-Keynesians simply use the empirical capital output ratio. It doesn't explicitly include energy. I'll show how it implicitly does shortly. Um, but that t turns out when you put it into the same framework as Bachmann has done for energy versus other inputs there, it means a one-for-one -one relationship between change in energy and change in GDP. Now, what I found very amusing is that Bachmann dissed the, dis, dissed the Leontief prediction by assuming that neoclassical theory is correct. And this is typical of how neoclassicals think. He said the Leontief asserts that the one-for-one -one relationship between change in energy and change in GDP. And that can't be right because if, okay, if, if factor markets are competitive and factor prices therefore equal marginal products. So we're back in the world I explained in the last lecture where the Cobb-Douglas production function uh, is validated by the fact that it fits the national um, um, income distribution data, which again shows one major point I make about neoclassical economics in general. And to some extent, it's true of the other approaches to economics as well. It's not a science because if a science found the sort of empirical relationship that Mankey identified where you've got to use a 0.8 coefficient, or if a science found the tautology involved in the actual model itself when you are using coefficients which, which are based on income, income distribution, the whole theory would shift. Now, this doesn't even turn up. I, I've, I've seen very few citations of Mankiw's work, and the economists still continue assuming a coefficient for uh, labour of 0 0.7 and from the capital of 0 0.3, when Mankey made the very good point that if you use a 0 0.3, you simply can't match the international data. In a real science, that would have changed the empirical value that people gave to that coefficient. In economics, they continue using the same value. So he said, well, let's assume that, let's assume that factor markets are competitive, therefore factor prices equal marginal costs, therefore, if you had this Leontia function, the price of energy would jump to, jump to a factor of 25 times, 1 over alpha, uh, which was 1 over 0 0.4, and the price of other factors would fall to zero. Uh, therefore, expenditure on energy would jump to 100%, other uh, factors would fall to zero. These are nonsensical, and that's correct. But they're nonsensical because the assumption that factor prices equal marginal products is nonsensical. And when you take the reason, it's actually, I, I just love this outcome. When you take a look at the data, which he said cannot possibly be one-to-one, -one, the data at the global level between change in any energy and change in GDP is one-for-one. -one. Here's the uh, relationship to GDP and energy at the glo global world product and energy consumption across the entire planet at the aggregate level. So the bottom is world energy, and you can see the source on the... On the uh, label for the graph there, and the vertical is world, world GDP. You can't get much tighter than that. But even more remarkably, when you look at the change in GDP and the change in energy, they have a huge correlation coefficient over 40 something years of 0 0.83. But more interestingly, the change is one for one. I'm using exactly the same scale uh, for the change in GDP, which is the blue line, and the change in energy, which is the red line. They fit one for one. So that is a, a, what, what Bachman has done unintentionally is provide another great empirical refutation of neoclassical theory. And here's my, one of my favorite quotes, the great tragedy of science, a beautiful theory destroyed by an ugly fact. So why do they get it so wrong? Well, it's again, because the standard production function they use ignores the role of energy completely. Here's your output in widgets per year. There's technology, which is rather ethereal in the neoclassical model. The amount of, of workers, the amount of machinery, and then the exponents sum to one, which is constant returns to scale, which is a reasonable assumption. And as I showed in the previous lecture, they base, base the value of the exponents on income shares, which they assume are equal to the marginal products of labour and capital. 
and therefore equal the real wage and the, and the profit rate. So labour gets 60 to 70 per cent, capital gets 30 to 40 per cent. What neoclassicals have habitually used for alpha is a variant value of 0 0.3, and you'll find that in papers written in 2022. Now, when they bring in energy, it's the third factor. So they now expand to A times L uh, times K times E, where the coefficients again sum to one. And the value they give to beta, again, is based on the share of energy in total GDP, which is between three and 5% of GDP. So Bachman used beta equals 0 0.4 in his model. But energy is not an independent third factor. It's an essential input to labour and capital, without which they can do no work. So rather than having L times K times E, you have L with E as an input and K with an E as an input, and therefore you get rid, the beta term disappears. And this is an important variation, even if you stick inside a Cobb-Douglas production function, which of course I'm not going to do, but just to show why they're, they're wrong here. So there's your number of workers, there's your number of machines, there's the, uh, and that's in, in units of labour, units of workers and units of machinery. The latter being a real problem, of course, to define. But as I said, uh, when working in yesterday's workshop uh, or the previous workshop, less of a problem for the post Keynesian than it is for the neoclassicals. There's the energy consumption per worker. Now that was trivial back in the days of Roman slaves. It's gigantic now. We consume an enormous amount of energy without even really being conscious that we're doing it. Uh, and that's the energy consumed by machinery, which has also grown exponentially over time. So if you go back to uh, my favourite comparison is of the James Watt steam engine to Elon Musk's Falcon 9, and the, uh, the James Watt steam engine consumed about nine tonnes of coal per day, and the Falcon 9 concerns, consumes about nine tonnes of uh, rocket fuel per second. Uh, so that's the energy consumption per unit. Then you have the efficiency with which that energy is turned into useful work. Now, in the case of workers, most of the energy we consume has got nothing to do with our con contribution to production. So e, a, a big e, as, as much as big E L has been rising over time, as we get to consume more and more of the, of the products of fossil fuels in the modern world, little e L has been going down. The product is remaining fairly constant. So the amount of energy that a unskilled worker puts into production today is similar to the amount of energy that a Roman slave put into production 2,000 years ago. So big EL times little EL, you can treat as a constant. Now EK, of course, has risen dramatically, and then little EK varies and not uh, normally you'd expect it to rise. There are times when it, when it goes backwards, but of course it faces limits based on the laws of thermodynamics. So that's that the, uh, what you have there, little e times big E with the two subscripts, talks about the conversion of the energy inputs to both labour and capital into useful work. Now, the, as I said, you can, you can treat e, big EL times little EL as effectively a constant because there's been no change in the work capacity of humans over the last 2,000 years, whereas e, big EK has grown exponentially. And if you rearrange the equation, and I'm leaving out the A because I can show that it's superfluous. So I've now made those substitutions here into the expressions for L and K here. Now I'll do a bit of rearranging. Uh, I take out the E L times E L and E K times E K. Here is our Cobb Douglas production function. Treat this as a constant. So I substitute this bit for a constant. This is now the energy output of the typical machine. And notice that the exponent for the energy is now alpha, which is not the 0 0.04 that uh, Bachman used, but 0 0.3 in their standard numbers. And that therefore means that the impact of energy is 10 times the level that neoclassicals normally think it is, even when you don't correct for their erroneous uh, uh, valuation of alpha. So if you modify Bachman's calculation, you find that rather than a 10% fall in energy causing a 0.4% fall in GDP, you're going to get about a 3% fall in GDP. So that's, that's dramatically different, but it's still not enough. Uh, be, uh, I'll go to a little elaboration here. What, when you do this reworking, you can show that what they call technology, 
in the Cobb Douglas production function is really the energy output of a representative machine at some time in history. So you have uh, Mankiw making an extremely good case that alpha should actually be not be 0 0.3 but 0 0.8. If you do that, then you get a coefficient for energy which is about 20 times the number that neoclassicals use. And if you feed that into Bachmann's calculation of what would be the impact of losing 10% of the energy supply to Germany, rather than getting the valuation he gave initially of 0.4%, you're now getting an 8% impact. Now that's huge, but it's still not enough because when you look at the empirical data, as I showed you earlier, it's a one for one relationship. So let's now take a look more deeply at where does this relationship come from? And the standard way that, uh, that post-Keynesian street production is to say that output in widgets is capacity utilization multiplied by the amount of capital divided by the empirically derived capital output ratio. Now let's just now make the same substitution I made with the uh, Cobb Douglas production function earlier and substitute K here for KE but that's equal to the number of machines times the energy per machine times the efficiency with which that energy is turned into useful output. And now let's acknowledge that Q, which is widgets per year, is actually related to uh, the amount of energy divided by the energy per widget. So there's now showing Y's output in energy terms and EK's energy per widget. Uh, then you now find that your empirical relationship is Q mod equal to U multiplied by K divided by V. The energy aware form doesn't change the U, doesn't change the K, but it substitutes EK for 1 over V. So little EK, the, the efficiency with which energy is converted into useful work by machinery, is the inverse of the capital output ratio. So the empirical regularity that post Keynesians use was actually a function of energy. And therefore, the, you get the basic argument that I showed earlier, a 10% fall in energy in a post-Keynesian model will cause a 10% fall in GDP. Now, let's have a bit of fun with uh, Backman's work here. So the way he derived the result that a 10% a fall in energy would cause in the strict Cobb-Douglas function a 0.4% fall in GDP, uh, he did substitutions and he made a little mistake there. Uh, he put in 0.25 rather than 0.4. So you fix that and you find that his argument is that, uh, you know, because of the coefficient, you take the derivative, uh, you get 0.04 multiplied by the tent to change in energy and you get a 0.4% fall. Whereas the Leontief case says 10% fall in energy, 10% fall in output. And he makes it, a, I find this sort of stuff so, so cute. Intuitively, the Leontief assumption means energy is an extreme bottleneck in production. Yes, of course it is. Only an economist could be surprised by that, and especially, of course, a, a neoclassical economist. Again, back to the fundamental point, nothing can be produced without energy inputs. So the mathematical form is not output as a function of K and L and E, but output as a function of K with E as an input and L with E as an input. And the correct formulation has huge consequences for the role of energy in production. So once we do the replacement, as I've shown that earlier, once we do the replacement and say V is actually, uh, one over V is actually EK, then you find the Leontief production function just by changing the terms and just by changing what we think the term means becomes explicitly energy aware. Now with that expression, if EK is the conversion of energy into useful work, you have one minus EK, which is waste output. And it's then possible to have an explicitly energy-based post-Keynesian macroeconomic model. And I've done, built that work with um, my colleagues, Matthias Roselli and Tim Garrett in a recent research project. So that's a model where we bring in energy, we say energy is an essential input into production. So here's your capital stock multiplied by energy, multiplied by the efficiency with which energy is converted into useful work. That's what gives you your output in widget terms. Divide that again by energy per widget and you then have the energy cycle, which is what this particular uh, loop explains. Um, but you can also talk about depleting the reserves you have and that therefore meaning you have 
declining production as you approach the depletion point because effectively the, the energy return on energy invested to get energy in the first place declines, so your productivity declines with it. And that shows a resource crisis there. Now, that is talking energy, but not bringing in matter. We've begun to do that. And are, amusingly, a, a useful mental construct to help us get the model built was the vision of the planet, the movie called The Planet of the Iron Giants or the Iron Giant movie. Uh, because when you look in the history of economic thought, you'll find that John Hicks attempted to model a production economy with matter and energy as inputs, fundamentally, back in 1935, but failed because he used bread as his consumption good and because he's working in a single commodity world, he also had bread as his capital good. Now, it's very hard to think of making anything with stale bread. So he didn't complete the model. We, on the other hand, said, let's work with a fictional consumption co uh, goods. So we have our workers on the planet of the iron giants consuming iron, uh, but you can also quite easily say, we're well, going to use iron to make the blast furnace, to make the mill, and to make the machines that dig up the, uh, the coal and the iron ore. So we managed to build a, a successful model that way, but it's only the very beginning. This is the initial report. That's actually an embedded PDF. So I'll save that on my Patreon website. Anybody who wants to read it, you can just extract the PDF and read the whole document. But this shows that the post-Keynesian approach to economics with MMT as part of its monetary modeling is potentially a foundation for a realistic biophysical economics. And that's what we should have had 250 years ago, when we had the physiocrats, when we could have built on their proper insight that there is no surplus, we are simply taking the free gift of nature and changing its form and squabbling over the distribution of, of goods and services from that free gift of nature. Uh, now very, very close to what could well be the end of capitalism, given the environmental crises we face in the next 10 or 20 years, we're finally starting to build a model of economics involving energy in the realistic way that the physiocrats once did. And uh, I'll continue on the issue of why is economics been so bad after the next workshop, which will show how to build a combined godly table and flowchart model in Minsky.